So good morning, everybody. This is Turning Towards Life with Lizzie and Justin, our third space project. Um, I am coming live to you this morning from Falmouth in Cornwall in the UK. And I'm dressed in this um, all weather gear because it's completely raining here. And um, I've just come off the boat to do this with you all. I'm going to try and keep my microphone away from this huge big jacket because it probably makes a noise every time it touches. So sorry about that. Um, I'm going to turn my camera around a little bit for you so you guys can see where I am. I'm in <clears throat> this place called Falmouth. There's these huge big boats and a port and beautiful countryside over there. And um, I am on a boat with five other people, one of them being my husband and another couple who are old friends of my husband's and then two visually impaired people who can't see anything and who are relying on us for the week to help them do this sailing. And I can't sail, so it's quite an interesting thing. And um, actually, the, the interesting thing is the source for this week is called In Safe Hands. And little did I know that it would feel very appropriate to be talking about safe hands whilst stepping into a boat and realising there are people relying on one another in a very particular way. And being in safe hands is really, really important, actually. So we are quite pleased with ourselves that we are doing this regardless of the circumstance we find ourselves in. Justin looks all sensible in his normal environment with a shirt on and a normal background. And I am completely bedraggled with um, no real uh, access to a normal environment to be in. So I thought that we should just carry on and keep doing this. And um, also it's quite fun that I'm in a ridiculously fluorescent hat trying to do this <laughs> so very warm welcome to you and um it's lovely to be here as always and i love it that we're just going to carry on trying to do this wherever we are i think it's the spirit of it so i'm very happy to be here i'm very very happy to be sharing the source as well this source is really beautiful to me so i'm very glad to be here mm. thank you lizzie it was so wonderful i'm really enjoying seeing you and your Anybody who's not from the UK may not know this term, Southwester, which is a, a, a thing that you wear to keep off the southwesterly gales. So, <laughs> oh, I never knew that. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. So I'm also, I'm really glad we're here. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, before we dive into the source, this part that you just said, Lizzie, seems really important to me, that because we're taking on this project as a practice, um, a practice, it seems to me, is something that you do for its own sake, again and again and again, in order to cultivate something. So this commitment that we've got, we'll see, have to see how we go over the coming months to, to do this, whether we're in the middle of a gale or on the side of a mountain or calling in from the middle of Guatemala or, or as I am today in my dining room. Um, it seems to me part of what it is to live a life of practice is to keep going, uh, not because it's convenient and not because uh, I want to today, although I know we find ourselves wanting to do this every time, but because a practice becomes something simply by being a practice. So this is our, I know that for me, this is, this is practice. Mm. So um, in London today, it's nothing like where Lizzie is. It's hot, it's sunny. It's a very glorious June day and we have a, a glorious and moving source for you and i'm thinking lizzie as you chose this mm -hmm. i think our practice so far has been that i'll read it first and then you'll read it yeah sure so this is um <clears throat> in safe hands <clears throat> it's by jeff foster you get tired of half truths don't you you get tired of pretending you get tired of the world's promises you get tired of waiting you even get tired of getting tired you get tired of you the one who gets tired of a divine disillusionment and a great paradox for who gets tired of whom in the midst of despair you find yourself staring life in the face naked and unprotected in front of its sacredness and for the first time, for whatever reason, you do not turn away. It breaks you open, it shatters your dreams, 
it burns up your certainty. Even your dreams of enlightenment do not stand a chance. You shit yourself with fear, you cry out for help. Why has it forsaken you? And then, for the first time, you feel deeply alive, undivided from life itself, resting in the arms of the one you always sought, unprotected yet utterly safe, free at last, free at last. It destroys the one you thought you were, but it never touches the one you are. This is the road less traveled, they say, a road leading not into the future, not to the promised land, but to the one reading these words now, to the one who knew all along that along this road's ancient edges lies the shed skin of lost identities and unkept promises. Clean yourself up, my friend. You are always in safe hands. Thank you, Justin. So beautiful. I've just moved because there's a lot of noise going where I was sitting just before. Okay, so I'm going to read this beautiful poem for us now. In Safe Hands. You get tired of half-truths, don't you? You get tired of pretending. You get tired of the world's promises. You get tired of waiting. You even get tired of getting tired. You get tired of you, the one who gets tired of. A divine disillusionment and a great paradox. For who gets tired of whom? In the midst of despair, you find yourself starting, sorry, you find yourself staring life in the face, naked and unprotected in front of its sacredness. And for the first time, for whatever reason, you do not turn away. It breaks you open, it shatters your dreams, it burns up your certainty. Even your dreams of enlightenment do not stand a chance. You shit yourself with fear, you cry out for help. Why has it forsaken you? And then, for the first time, you feel deeply alive, undivided from life itself, resting in the arms of the one you always sought, unprotected yet utterly safe, free at last, free at last. It destroys the one you thought you were, but it never touches the one you are. This is the road less traveled. They say a road leading not to the future, not to the promised land but to the one reading these words now, to the one who knew all along, that all along this road's ancient edges lies the shed skin of lost identities and unkept promises. Clean yourself up, my friend. You were always in safe hands. <laughs> There's something... Um incredibly upending for me about this because it it talks to a place there's a way in which I know this place that Jeff Foster is writing from and there's a way in which it's totally disorientating mm. to have him write this way like uh, those moments when we find out that everything that we've taken ourselves to be have been some kind of misunderstanding Mm -hmm. and everything we've been trying to grab hold on you know grab hold of has been mistaken because what we needed was was always here and what we were were always here like in one way lizzie this is so easy to say but as i was reading as and as you were reading i was thinking to myself um yes jeff i get what you're saying and it's so beautiful and so powerful and there's a part of me that's very attached to yeah, but the way I know myself and all the things I'm trying to have happen and all the things I'm trying to avoid, they are what I'm meant to be doing, right? Even though they so often bring pain and despair and confusion and all of those kind mm -hmm. of things. So, so I'm noting my, noticing myself sort of being turned upside down and inside out by the encounter of, of this. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I know what it's like. You know, like with a Mobius strip, you know a Mobius strip, you yeah. take a ring of paper and you 
you cut it, you, you twist it so that the inside is the outside and the outside is the inside. There's no inside and no outside. Yeah. I'm afraid to say, I think that's what, that's what Jeff is trying to do with us. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, for me, it's like the articulation in this poem is kind of like, it feels like the articulation of my path. You know, when he talks about you look back on the path and there's some skin that's been shed and all of the times when there's something that I've taken myself to be that have turned out not to be true you know the the the, the, the when he uses the word certainty and actually certainty was one of the words in, our, in last week's poem as well it was the part of the way things are dead is that that we're certain to things and his poem feels like a, an articulation of the path and that you could read it again and again and again and it would still apply. It's not, it's, it's one that doesn't have a destination almost. And for me, the faithful, deep support in this poem is the way that Jeff talks about for the first time not turning away and not running from whatever is wanting to be felt or heard or seen in our process of unfolding of a human being of being a human being and this kind of this this invitation to the safety to be to, because we're already in safe hands we are safe to turn towards life and yet again it feels like there's a very explicit link between the name of our project of turning towards life and one of the sources that we bring where it feels like turning in, turning towards and not being in avoidance is a safe thing to do. And so somehow when it gets written about and when we speak about it with each other, this faith bubbles up in me that the darkness is not going to eat me, that I can be with what's here and it's okay. And this is a very ordinary human thing to be doing is turning towards and being with and it's not as terrifying as I might have thought if someone else hadn't said it too so I feel really supported in that and this feeling of being in safe hands just being true that that's the nature of being a being is that there is an inherent safety in being a being so all the ways we're trying to make ourselves safe with controlling things, wanting things a certain way, um, having a certain self-image that we portray into the world so that we feel secure, all those things we can kind of let go a little bit more of because of the message of safety that, that this, this brings. There's something um, so radical in what you're saying, Lizzie, and in Jeff, Jeff's poem that I'm wondering if we can pull apart together. So to be safe in the way that you're suggesting means is a, a claim that there's some way in which we're safe even when we're not, even when the worst thing that we've imagined is actually happening. Like this isn't, I really get that, that Jeff's poem is not um, intended to be a cover up. It's not uh, trying to say, well, you know this situation you're in where something's happening like there are times in life when we're afraid that something's going to happen and what we're doing is we're turning away from the thing that we're afraid of like i'm afraid of being ashamed or i'm afraid of being ill or i'm afraid of and it seems to me it, it's an obvious thing to say that turning towards what's in front of us is always a life-giving move because it brings us squarely into contact with life and we've talked about that a lot and if it seems this way to you as well, but there's an even more radical move that's being made in the poem here, which is to say that even when it's not okay, there's a way in which things are okay. And this is really, this is conceptually really difficult because it sounds like a contradiction. And yet, you know, he says it really, oh, oops, just uh, messed up our video stream here. Oh, I'm gonna get us back onto gallery view, right? Um, uh, unprotected yet utterly safe. Mm. Mm. So I think this is really important because 
without without that, this could easily be like a. I, do, I know it's not, but you, you could easily see it like a positive thinking something. It's fine. Everything's fine. So it's tricky because I, you know, I know how many times I get terrified. And um, and yet what, he's, what Jeff is saying seems really true. So I'm sort of stumbling a bit with this. I'm trying to find a way of um, talking about it. Mm. Well, I think it's hard to talk about because I think it's a spiritual thing. And I think I think it's our nature, and of course, it's really difficult to talk about our essence or our nature or or being itself. But it feels to me like this conversation is about the ground of being. And how, if you like, our personalities, which are terrified, of course they're terrified. They're, they, they are um, based in, in fear so much of the time. And it feels to me like this is a big poem of the and realm that I think we talked about a bit last week and something that my sister Holly Um, on the workshop that her and my mum did a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the big ands, which is that I am, I am unsafe and I'm safe. There's a way of, of encountering ourselves or, or there's an invitation to encounter ourselves as being in contact with what feels real and being more deeply present to the and like what, what else is here as well. And it feels to me, certainly for my own inquiry, that there is a basic safety that exists beyond my ideas of who I am. And if I take the invitation into the divinity that each of us is in in the deeper truth of what it means to be a being, that that's where inherent safety lies. That's where the inherent welcome of being a being lies. And knowing a little bit of Jeff's story as well, that that this this message or this writing that he does and this speaking being that he does comes out of having gone deep down into the darkness and into something else that's more real and more ground than the difficulties that we face as as personalities as egos as a set of circumstances and happenings and so the difficulty of talking about it feels to me kind of inherent in the encounter with it because the words are never going to be the thing we're pointing to something and it's in, in it's in each of our hands to step into deepen into become present to the being that we are and i think it feels to me like jeff has been in the being and is speaking from the beingness and that's why it's so hard for us to encounter it as regular personalities going to the supermarket and getting toast or whatever as and having really tricky lives lots of the time is that it takes something else other than those patterns of habitual response to life where we stay still for a while and see what this being is and that that never-ending journey to encountering our own being fully feels like what this this poem is inviting us to and i and i'm moved by it too because i also think that it's not some removed thing but for example when you read that poem to me or my husband reads it to me or my sister reads it to me or I read it to someone it's also a clear demonstration to me that we are this for each other you are a safe pair of hands for me to be in and likewise I am a safe pair of hands like this is what we can be to each other too and that that being is not outside of each of us and we can be for each other in service of each other too. So I think it's a universal being that is not 
exclusive of our individual beings because it's one and the same thing. I think this last point that you make might be a is one path into the the way our personalities get caught up with reading this the confusion the difficulty that we have because um <clears throat> so where my mind goes right away is well when i'm facing my own death how can you tell me that i'm safe mm. like how dare you tell me that i'm safe because the me that i know that i'm so attached to that i experience is at, is at risk here you know, who knows, in some way that I can't even understand, but certainly at risk. And you're, you're reminding us, Lizzie, that one of the places we get to see the truth in this poem is when we encounter others and we find out that who I, who I take myself to be, this separate something, can't be the case when I encounter another human being or another living anything, because when we recognise when the life that's in us recognizes the life in the other thing, the other being, the other life, or the being in us recognizes the being in the other being. Again, I have to get twisted with words here. We find out that um, beyond our own attachment to our own security is something way, way, way deeper and more vast in which we can rest that we're inseparable from. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it really reminds me of um, two things. So one is, one is from my own experience, which was having had um, a very close encounter with my own death that I've spoken about, of course, with you, but here as well, with, with having um, blood clots moving through the inside of my body and then having shortly afterwards a really clear experience of, oh, I'm... I'm an expression of life arising from life all the time. I'm not, um, I went on this beautiful walk where for a moment, I think I got from the inside what Jeff was saying. I'm just not separate from all of this and my own identity, my own separateness that I'm so attached to is just one way of experiencing this whole something that I'm an expression of. So again, it's very, very hard to put into language, but, but the best language I've come across, I don't think I have language, good language from my own experience yet. But there's an amazingly beautiful story about the novelist of, of Dostoevsky, I don't know if you know this one, Lizzie, that he was, he was um, sentenced to death mm. by the Tsar. He was going to be executed by firing squad and he was on the wagon on the way to the execution ground feeling very afraid. And then he saw um, a tin shed with uh, sunlight glinting, you know, the way sunlight glints off the shed. And he got in a very profound way, I am that, that sunlight, I am that sunlight already. So whatever happens, I am that. Not even I'm gonna become that, that and me mm -hmm. are the same. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't get executed. So he lived the rest of his life in the midst of that understanding that there's a, like Jeff is saying, there's a profound kind of safety that comes from realizing that there's something that we're really attached to isn't the end of things. Mm. And I don't mean the end of things in some future heavenly way, because who knows anything about that? I mean, not the end of things uh, now. How can I be anything other than an arising of this whole of which I'm a part, in which there's a very profound kind of safety, safety symptom, because it is. Yeah. It's just reminding me as well, like, of this way we can be with these things where we don't have to, like, believe everything that someone says in a poem. But it was also good to allow something to be there and let it have whatever way it wants to have with you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so huge what, what Jeff is saying. And for me, anyway, allow the possibility of what he's saying to be true feels very supportive and a good thing to do.
even if I'm not completely and wholly um, in that state myself or something, that there is a way that for me to relax into the invitation really helps to be present and to, to enjoy and to find joy when it's difficult. I can already feel it now. You know, I've just come out of the, the boat where there's six people, nobody's slept well, everybody's saying, can I change beds? Nobody can, I mean, you literally couldn't swing a cat, a really small kitten in this boat <laughs> and it's raining. And in this conversation now, I'm already feeling the support of something deeper a deeper kind of reality that lets me be in the practicalities of making a bacon sandwich without any knives and <laughs> and this funny little cooker that doesn't really work and taking care of the situation with some more lightness so I think that's what this brings for me is a profound invitation and support for the difficulty and one that also allows me to let go, even if it's momentarily. A reminder just to be a little less grippy on my version of what's going on and entertain that, like you're saying, like we are like Dostoevsky as he is the light. We might be the light. And if I'm the light, maybe the seasickness that is going to inevitably before me might be less difficult because I might not suffer it so badly because there's some notion of I am light in my being that I can allow through a crack in my existence, my, my everydayness. You might suffer, you might um, suffer the seasickness in one way in exactly the same way, but what you might not have is the terrible, desperation that um this not be happening that it has to end mm. seems to me that that's one of the one of the openings that comes from letting you're so wise on this lizzie with this poem that we have to let it soften us and affect us rather than it's of course it's interesting to try and work it out at the same time mm. But I'm really, I'm really taken by what you're saying that Jeff is saying here, which is um, there's a way in which when we stop trying to have our experience not be the experience that we're having, mm. that we find ourselves returned to a something that we are, that we knew all along, mm. but which we've forgotten. Mm. So whether that's in... Some of us do our best to keep joy out. Mm. I know that part in myself. And some of us do our best to keep our suffering out or our fear out. Mm. And so many um, very profound spiritual paths have the idea of return mm -hmm. built right into the middle of them. Mm -hmm. that, re that returning is always the path. That it's, that it's never something out there some far away land to get to. In fact, there is nowhere to get to. That's the thing that we've forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, so right in the midst of seasickness or right in the midst of illness or right in the midst of terror or right in the midst of ecstasy and joy mm -hmm. is the possibility that we might catch a glimpse of the one who we've taken ourselves to be not being the one who we actually are. Yeah. And also what you just said reminds me of, I happened to sit with Sharon Salzberg once, who is the author of loads of books around kindness and is her life's mission to practice loving kindness. And I think we were doing a meditation and I said, oh gosh, you know, I just keep going away from myself. Like, what's, what's wrong with me? I, I, you know, I sit there and I try and sit and meditate and practice loving kindness and mind like thinking about biscuits in Waitrose or something, you know, like really mundane. Like I just want to escape clearly what I'm doing. And she was so sweet. She was, she said, you know, the important thing to always remember is that the healing is in the return. 
And so you have to go away from yourself to experience the healing in the return. And it gave me this kind of permission to just let myself be away from myself because the coming back will happen and it does happen. And that's where the healing lies, not in the being somewhere constantly itself. And that kind of self-compassion feels like a real necessariness given how much I know I'm away with the fairies or completely off or distracted or avoiding or denying, you know, all of the things I get up to. So having faith in the return being where it's at inherent in that means that it's okay to be away and to come home again millions and trillions of times. And here's something I'm, I'm seeing from what you've just said <clears throat> that is really also, um, uh, what's the word coherent with this um, experience that I've done a very poor job of trying to give words to of finding myself not separate from everything, which was a kind of return as well, which is um, many of our returns to a deeper contact with or a deeper understanding of what we are um, happen without our effort. Mm. Like a lot of our attempts, it's one of the things I love about Jeff Foster's work is that he keeps on reminding us in this very um, way that's so hard for us to get our heads around in a culture which is so oriented to, well, if you do this, then that will happen. That mm. somehow whatever return happens is going to be because of my own effort. But actually, yeah. often I think it's a kind of um, grace. We find ourselves far away and then we get caught by surprise that I've been returned to mm. myself, my sense of myself. Oh, even these words are, are woefully inadequate for what we're talking about here. But so beautiful what Sharon Salzberg says that the healing is in the return. So when we find ourselves returned, mm-hmm. do we, um, can we allow for that rather than fighting it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Jeff, um, the last thing I'm going to say is um, Jeff Foster's story is really worth reading about for anyone who's encountering his work the first time, if you can find his account of how he first Mm. came into an understanding of what it was that he um, needed to speak about or write about, because it's an it's really extraordinary story of finding himself right in the situation that he's writing about here of being caught in the midst of darkness, um, visited by something, some fresh understanding that he didn't choose. And I think that's partly what we're saying, isn't it, Busy, that when we, when we stop our strenuous efforts to turn away from life so strongly, there's a chance that we might find ourselves awake in a new way, but probably not, not from our efforts, more from whatever it is that is not us or that is us that we didn't know doing its work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. this is so lovely to have this conversation and it's really supportive of me now and what I'm about to enter back into and um, one thing I will say is that the the God or creation or whatever made me blessed me with a sense of humour and I think that's what I'm going to (laughs) need Oh God! Yes, I know. Honestly, thank goodness because it is really hairy, and it's going to be an adventure, and it's going to be funny. It's already funny, but maybe for the wrong reasons, if you know what I mean. And it's very cramped and very tricky, and um, <laughs> and also very funny. So it will be what it will be, and I um, am grateful that I'm. I've kind of being witnessed by whoever's watching this, and you, Justin in this moment of my life because it is extraordinary and um i maybe show you my full outfit so i've got these like ridiculously uh fluorescent trousers on and my little sandals and this funny borrowed jacket and it's um yeah it's very glamorous that's what i would say sitting on these little steps in Falmouth, <laughs> talking to you all so next week when we do this <clears throat> i'll have to try and arrange myself to <laughs> yes hanging off the side of a mountain or something <laughs> <laughs> you can be on a trapeze lesson or something. That would be really good. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
so we'll, we'll all get to find <laughs> out um, <laughs> next Sunday when you're back from your adventure on the high seas. Yes, what it was like. What you doing, what it was like. Absolutely. Well, I, we've reached our time for this morning, so I want to say thank you to you, Lizzie, and that we get to do this, and thank you to everyone who's in this with us. Mm-hmm. Welcome to uh, the people who've joined us this week. We keep on growing, which is fun to see. Mm-hmm. And um, we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and you'll get an update of the debacle of my sailing holiday in Cornwall next week. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye.